Welcome to the, the third panel, as Jennifer said, how to produce and use images ethically. Um, one of the, the challenges of being the third panel of the day is that uh, so many things that you would plan to discuss have already been discussed. However, we have a stellar lineup here, and so I think we're going to bring up some new issues and uh, dive quite deeply into others. Um, let me introduce them. Next to me is Aarti Kapoor. Uh, Aarti is Managing Director and Lead uh, Consultant at Embode, an international human rights consultancy. Aarti manages a broad portfolio across Asia and Africa, including issues such as forced labor, human trafficking, and child exploitation. Prior to establishing Embode, Aarti led Project Childhood, an Australian government initiative against child sexual exploitation in tourism across Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam for World Vision. Throughout her career, Artie has worked with journalists on issues of human trafficking and sexual exploitation, and has a particular interest in the way vulnerable people are portrayed. Welcome, Artie. Next to Artie is Jessica Lim. Jessica is director of the Angkor Photo Festival and Workshops, which takes place annually in Siem Reap in Cambodia. Jessica started her career as a news and photojournalist in her home country of Singapore. She then moved to Dhaka, Bangladesh, to take up the roles of photo and news editor at Drick Picture Library, as well as Photo Liaison for Majority World, a photo agency that works with photographers from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East, promoting equal access to the global image market. Good to have you here, Jessica. Uh, next to Jessica is uh, Jennifer Samuel. Uh, Jennifer is a photo editor at National Geographic magazine, where she edited a number of stories in the April 2018 race edition, which I have a copy of here. Prior to National Geographic, uh, she worked with Photoville, Anastasia Photo, Hank Willis Thomas, and was co-founder and curator of the Brooklyn Photo Salon. She was an associate producer on several films that aired on PBS Frontline, Independent Lens, POV, and the BBC, covering a wide range of topics, including climate change, race, education, and Hurricane Katrina. Good to have you here, Jennifer. And at the end is Stanley So. He is the education manager at Oxfam Hong Kong, uh, where he manages the Interactive Education Center to promote global citizenship and education. He has run two public campaign exhibitions, Do You Read Me?, a photo exhibition on how ethnic minorities learn Chinese in 2014, and Poverty Full Time, an art exhibition on working poverty in 2017. He led Oxfam's climate change campaign from 2007 to 2011, and helped shape their Make Trade Fair campaign, including activities around the WTO ministerial meeting here in Hong Kong. Before joining Ho uh, Oxfam, he was also a journalist working on development, globalization, trade, and the environment. And welcome, Stanley. Um, so before we dive into the panel, I just want to show an image uh, that will give us some context about the, the topics we're going to talk about, but also We'll, we'll tell you a little bit about the genesis of this panel. Am I too far away? Or do you, do you just do it? Oh. Okay. So in two, April 2017, a colleague of mine in Singapore sent me a link to this Facebook post. It was promoting a a competition. Uh, the post was by Lens Culture, which, if you don't know, is a online platform uh, showcasing photography and also runs a lot of competitions. And it was in collaboration with the Magnum Photo Agency. Uh, it depicts a 16-year-old girl who has been uh, trafficked into forced prostitution in a brothel in Kolkata, uh, and it shows you her being about to be raped or being raped by a client of the brothel. When I saw this, I immediately uh, 
thought that it was problematic on several levels. Um, and I posted a response uh, online. And as is the one of uh, social media, there was a debate around uh, what was happening here, particularly focused on the photographer. If we can go to the, the next image. Oh, it's working. Let's try. OK, so because of this debate, people began to dig a little bit into this photographer's uh, past. And this image emerged. Uh, and it turns out that the photographer had appropriated part of an image by another photographer uh, working uh, on a project in uh, Mumbai back in 1970s on sex workers. And he placed one of the uh, individuals from that photo into his. The response to that unethical uh, uh, conduct caused much more of a response and it was universally condemned within the, the photo industry which was debating it as being unethical. Yet the photo before had, the response had been much more polarized around supporting or not supporting him. And I thought this was odd, that somehow our priorities were, were wrong. Um, so this was one of the things that made me begin to think about uh, the sort of the ethics of the photo and things around consent uh, and representation. And questions like, do we d disproportionately see images of sex workers in Asia, and if so, why? Are they represented in a different way than uh, photographic work on sex workers in Europe and the US? How do we know if informed consent was gathered? And why is so little attention paid to this? And then there were the legal aspects. Were any laws broken here? And if so, what were they? And why didn't the ph photographer know about them? So I want to come to you, Artie, as a, as a qualified lawyer and a human rights activist. Um, we've talked a lot on the, the preceding panels about consent, um, but we haven't really dived into what the, the consequences of, of going against someone's consent really mean. And I want to know about, uh, particularly around those who have experienced trauma uh, or sexual abuse, what are the risks to them in regards to being represented against their will? So first out, I just want to say that when, when we're talking about children, we're talking about any person, if we're following international law, we're talking about any person under the age of 18. So in the first photo, that is a child. She's, if she's 16, um, which is um, what's, what, you, you, what you said, then she's a child. And according to um, international law and most national laws, um, any decision that's made around a child needs to be made in the best interests of the child. So that's a paramount principle. Um, also, under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, any victim, uh, child victim of exploitation needs to have his or her identity kept private and not public. So this is also viola violating legal standards. Um, so that's just straight off. Um, so I don't know why lens, lens culture doesn't know that and things like this. I mean, even national laws in India and different countries, the UK where the um, photographer is from, um, has that in national law. Um, and then there's the um, risks that you said. Um, so firstly, the risk to the child herself, she's completely lost control of her, that image of her being um, raped or sexually abused. She's lost control of it, she doesn't have she will not have any control over that story as she um, transitions into being an adult. And every time that photo is seen, it's an image of her being violated again and again. So this is an image, is a picture of, it's a picture of a criminal offense taking place, and she's lost control over that. So that's one risk. Then, of course, any 
fear, if it's a trafficking victim, if somebody's actually, you know, th there's the fear of reprisal against her, um, the harm done to her family, which Julia was talking about this morning. Um, and so there's all this harm that's being done, and it, it will continue to be done every time that image is being used again and again. And right now, like, that image is out there. There's no way of taking it back. Yeah, indeed. Um, just to, to move on uh, in regard to this story a little bit. Um, so obviously when mistakes are made or uh, uh, issues like this come up, there's a lot of focus on the photographer. Um, and in this case, the photographer was fairly young and new to the industry. Um, but what came out, and I think it's very interesting, uh, was reveal, revealed the role of editors and organizations. Uh, and I just want to read you a short quote from uh, Time Magazine's Lightbox, uh, which uh, published two articles on this, uh, one in May 2017. Anyone reading the caption could see that the girl was only 16. And yet, in the two years since Data took the picture, many established photo editors, photographers, and organizations saw the image. And often they responded by encouraging Data's work, not by questioning his judgment. Some of these experts sat on juries that awarded Data with cash prizes and grants. Time estimates that Data received more than 30,000 US dollars from such sources over the last three years. So I think it's been mentioned a couple of times uh, by past panels, but it's more than just the photographer. Uh, it's more than just the editor. It's more than just the organization. It's more than just the audience. I think we have to think of these things in more of a holistic way. Um, Bearing that in mind, um, let me come back to you, Artie, uh, sort of carrying on from what you were saying about the, the trauma. Uh, you've worked in NGOs, and you all run a human rights consultancy now. Often the justification for images such as this is exposing a problem, giving voice to the voiceless, etc. cetera. Yeah? Uh, but I wonder if you could say a little bit about uh, how uh, the risks to these people is, uh, or let me rephrase that, um, that the risks uh, that people are exposed to uh, when they're photographed, how much of this is determined by the actual process itself? Yeah? So we've talked about you know, having a moral compass, having codes, et cetera. Is the experience itself, both in being photographed and the resulting photographs, does that influence the experience for the, the person, whether it's a negative experience or actually a useful experience? So there's uh, two, two kind of questions in there that I want to answer. So the first one is about exposing the problem. And in the last panel, we were hearing about the Rohingya people and the crisis and how difficult it is to access those people. Um, and therefore, by taking these photos, you're exposing a problem. But I asked the question as to Sonagachi is a well-known red light district in India. It's huge. I don't know how many thousands of people are being exploited um, and, or working there. What needs to be exposed? Does it, does it need an exposure? And is it really an exposure? Um, you know, I worked on... Uh, human trafficking and sexual exploitation in Cambodia for, for many years and still continue to work in that field. Um, one of the reasons why people think that Cambodia has this huge problem of sexual exploitation and trafficking is because photographers and journalists can get access um, like this to, to victims. You go over the, the um, border to Vietnam and you can't get that kind of access to red light districts and trafficking, even though it's happening there. So what, what are you exposing? That's one question. And then the other part of it is, what about the, if you're exposing a human rights issue, what about the rights of the subject and the photo? Um, so your question about the process by which the photo is taking place, um, or the imagery, I think it's about what's the purpose of the photo being taken in the first place. 
in the earlier panel, we heard that if you're taking a photo for a competition, then you should leave the room. Now, I'm wondering what was the purpose of this photo, for example. If the purpose of the photo is to um, expose the problem, then what about the rights of the person in the photo? If the purpose of the photo is, to, is for advocacy, that's something else. If the purpose of the photo is for fundraising, that's something else. If the purpose of the photo is for art, that's something else. So, so this is the question I ask. If the purpose of the photo, which I've also seen, is to empower the survivors and victims of trafficking, then again, you're talking about something quite different. That would impact that subject in a completely different way if he or she was completely directing her own story or narrative around how she wants to be photographed. So I think, yes, it does, the experience of how, how the victim is shown um, does have an impact, but it also depends on what the purpose is of the image being taken. Sorry, it's a long-winded answer. I, I think it's, I think it's very important that we that we consider uh, these issues in the sort of complexity that they actually exist, and and that's why I want to ask you also about consent because again, it's something that's been mentioned a, a few times today, um, but I want to ask you in in the context again of someone who's experienced trauma or, or sexual abuse, consent is often seen as a sort of a one-off deal. You know, do you mind if I take your photo and publish it in this way? You sign it. By, I might never see you again, yeah? Um, and if you change your mind, what to do? But what I want to ask you is, in the situations where someone has experienced trauma, is there a particularly good reason that consent should be an ongoing process because of how trauma is dealt with over your life and the decision you make at one point may be something you would definitely wish to overturn at another point? I think this is really interesting. Now, when we're talking about children, um, there is what we call the age, the age of consent to have sex. So um, in certain countries, the age of consent to have sex is set at different, age, at different levels. So in the UK, for example, it's 15. Um, in other countries, it's 16 to 18. So that means that if a child is, if somebody under that age of consent is having sex with somebody else, even if he or she has said yes, they're not legally able to. So that's the first thing. So then in terms of what, what is the age of consent for, for having your photograph taken in a sexual nature? Now, we also have this problem globally where uh, a lot of teenagers are taking self-generated sexual images and, and, and they post them. So, so we're talk, first we're talking about age. That's one aspect. Then the second aspect is this uh, traum, traum, can a traumatized person consent to their photograph or image being taken and then it being used. I like the idea of, let's say, an adult um, having to, being asked to give consent, you know, recur in a recurring manner. I just can't see the practicalities of it because once an image is out there, you've lost control. So it can't be taken back. But I like the idea of it and I hadn't, thought of it, but how it could be until I heard Patrick talk about this on the earlier panel, about how he was going back to Regina, Regina um, and, um, you know, and asking her, is this okay, is this okay, and, you know, having a journey around it. But I just don't think that would be possible in every situation. But I do like that idea of it, this ongoing relationship with the subject in the photo. Um, I'd like to show another image now and, and bring in uh, Jessica and, and Stanley on this. So this was, this was uh, brought to my attention by a, a, a photographer in India. Um, the image is, uh, this particular image um, is of a, a woman um, and there is, there is captured information there, uh, but much of it is largely in inaccurate. Um, but it was from a series which included uh, girls and women who had been abused uh, by an Italian photographer, and it had been entered in the Kuala Lumpur uh, Photo Festival um, and had, I think it had been awarded. Um, and questions came up around whether uh, the women and the girls had consented to be identified. 
uh, and we had a dialogue uh, with the, the competition. And although they would have stringent rules, as, as many, like World, World Press would have, over the manipulation of an image digitally, they had nothing in place to ensure that consent had been given. And we discussed this with them, and they were very honest and, and forthright with it. Uh, and they talked to the, the panel of judges, and they decided that we would take his word for it. Now, of course, they weren't in a position to do much else in, in many respects because they hadn't got these rules in place. But I thought it was interesting because it goes back to you asking about why lens culture didn't know and think about these things. Um, and I think there's a disconnect when we, we talk about, for example, AFP and the, their codes of ethics and what some of these photo competitions have in place, which haven't thought about these issues. I wonder, Jessica, if you could talk a little bit about whether you've experienced things like this at Angkor, because you, you display a lot of uh, work there. And if so, what, what do you do about it? Well, I have to qualify that um, uh, in the past, um, I, I, I did not do the curation. I'm not trying to say I'm not involved in it, but um, this this issue definitely is, is new. Um, in terms of when I started out, I don't think that we had conversations like this, nor would we have to worry that there would be conversations like this. But uh, I'm very happy um, that we are now being forced, more or less, um, to confront it, even though it's going to be technically um, very complicated, um, for us to be able to ascertain everything that we show, that it lives up to our you know, principles and this code of ethics. And I think that for a few more years, you will definitely see um, failures. Uh, of things that slip through. Um, but I think that we need to reach a point where it's no longer due to ignorance, but you know, uh, more out of callousness than ignorance. So we need to get to a point where you can't say that, well, I mean, I, I didn't know about this, uh, and, and be held up to that um, higher level of standard and expectations. Um, yeah. But also, I, I also want to point out, not oh, again, not that it makes any difference, but the work that's shown as a festival that's intended to be a celebration of a, a professional nature, and the work that's selected to be published in the next day's news front page of a newspaper, that you know, we have the lead time uh, that goes into that curation process. So if anything, we should be the ones we have the time and the luxury of time to make sure that everything that we show lives up to those standards, right? I'm not saying that we have, but uh, I'd rather not throw us under the bus right now, but uh, I think we definitely are going to work there towards that. Just to add another layer to this, um, the, the Italian photographer who produced this work uh, was in part commissioned by Action Aid. Uh, large humanitarian NGO. Um, and so that brings me to, to Stanley. Um, I know you're going to talk about uh, the, the measures you have in place at Oxfam in regards to the use of photos. But I wonder if you say something specific about how Oxfam might work, because it's, you know, it's a, a, a sort of federalized organization, um, and whether those standards can be applied across the entire uh, sort of structure. Uh, and also what you do here in Hong Kong in regards to things like consent. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yes. Um, how to start with, yeah, you know, well, OSFAM is an international confederation, you know, against poverty. And uh, we use quite a lot of images, yeah, as uh, what Arti said, you know, trying to expose a problem. But I think one point of departure is because I've gone through, you know, the, all the panels are sharing and I because I used to work as a journalist in Hong Kong, and uh, and I share quite a lot of uh, old sentiments around, you know, how to use the pictures to expose the problems. But I think for Oxfam, we also we 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 don't use photos to only to expose a problem. We don't stop there because uh, we are changing organizations. We want to make change, so we use the photos to communicate for social change. So there is some kind of agenda behind. Yeah, and to change people's perceptions. So 
photo itself is not alone. So we have a, quite a lot of story behind. We have quite a lot of activities, public engagements to push that. But answering back, you know, your your questions about you know how we work with all the different you know photographers or uh, you know. Uh, we have a quite a lot of um, you know internal guidelines and also um, you know code of conduct you know in terms of how we should use the photos. But I think one fundamental thing is that we use quite a lot of consent basis, consent. So, uh, for example, what well, I'm not talking about you know the the contest in terms of emergency in Rohingya, you know, because we also work on a quite a lot of not very emergency situations because poverty is not only about you know oh there's a war there's a you know that kind of things there are quite a lot of you know it seems uh, 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 poverty strengthened you know situations in Africa or in India or in Hong Kong as well they are not that you know emergent in the first place but we want to tell the story so we got to we work with quite a lot of um, you know local NGOs. We work with our partners who work with those communities. So we always try to get consensus with those people, uh, uh, and also have a lot of engagement. So it's not only just I go there and take photos and then leave. So it's not like that. Yeah. So normally we have a project there, and we work with those people for a long time. So there's a long-term relationship there already. So it's not only photos taking. So it's there quite a lot of trust built in, a lot of consensus, and also they know how we are going to use those photos. And the photographers that we engage with, or the agency we, we engage with, they also knew that. They understand the context. So that's why I think we, when we put all this into the context, then um, yeah, I think you know the kind of issues that you know the, the other panelists raise. Um, for us, that's not really a major concern. We all follow all this, and we build in all this trust. You know the contests, um, the relationships, the collaborations, all into the project itself. Yeah. So, I hope I you know answer the question. Yeah. Um, thanks, Stanley. Uh, just going back to the um, the the. The photo of the the woman or the girl in on lens culture. One of the the things that came up quite a lot, and it, c it comes back to what you were saying, Arti, about um, I think the term that Tanvi used. When what is the value of this image? Yeah, uh, it's not exposing anything that a lot of people or, you know, did. They already knew about it, uh, and there was a lot of work being done on the ground to, to address the problem. Um, I wonder. Um, if we can talk a little bit about that. There, there was a, a critique of, you know, I think I mentioned it, you know, oh, we're seeing another photo project by an outsider on sex workers in Asia, yeah? Um, and, and, and about this sort of representation. And uh, Jessica, I know that from your work with, with Drake, and particularly Majority World, part of the re reason for Majority World being was about uh, a reaction to this type of representation, yeah? Um, and the sort of the, the stereotyped images, the, the narrowing of the, the frame and the focus on only a, a, a small number of subjects. You mentioned particularly Cambodia as an example. I wonder if you could say a little bit of, about the, the mission of Majority World uh, and it's uh, trying to address the sort of uh, the issue of diversity um, and how that should impact on this, this sort of imbalance in representation. I think that um, there's, t there's two parts to it because you're right, uh, Shaidu Alam, who I think all of us are very upset uh, to not be here. I can't say it better than, than, he, than, he, uh, than, than he will. Uh, but he started Drake in 1989. Uh, no, actually I'm not using these slides right now. But Sorry. Oh, wait. Actually, you know, yeah, we could yeah. quickly. Yeah, you're right. I forgot about the slides, actually. But yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, no, I mean, this is a contextualization. It's just, I've already gone ahead. But yeah, uh, not these, not this, this not mine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I just I just press this. Yeah. Okay. Um, just very quickly, I mean, um, in 1989, Shaidu started Drake, um, and his 
the word Drake means uh, inner vision, philosophy of vision in Sanskrit. And it was about um, his vision of a more egalitarian world. It was about a world in which the underrepresented or the majority world had more of a say in how they were being represented. And it was um, addressing what he saw uh, to be the obstacle created by dominance of the Western media. Um, and so when he started Drake and subsequently in 2005 and six Majority World, um, it was about addressing that uh, gap. And um, I, I just, before I came, just very quickly into Getty Images uh, editorial search using the most popular filter uh, for the keyword Bangladesh. These were the top four images, uh, cricket, child bride, and the terrorist attack that happened a few years ago. And um, if I, I was like, okay, well, that's news, so that's not very fair. Let's, let's try daily life. And I was like, oh, so we got the climate change, floods, pollution, and um, a boat. Uh, this is uh, actually was in context of the Rohingyas uh, arriving. Uh, in Bangladesh, um, I I think that uh, if the next slide, these are uh, images by Drake photographers. So when I was there in two thousand uh, five, six, seven, eight, uh, we had in the agency about two hundred plus photographers, and this was twenty years after he had started Drake and subsequently the School for Photography, Pachala. And I think that what he was trying to do was, all right, so you know, uh, the Western media can't seem to find us. We're going to help them find us. We're, we're going to make sure that there are so many of us that we, you can't claim anymore that, these, that we don't exist. And I think he was very, very successful in that. Yeah. Um, the mission of, uh, of, of Scheidel and, and, and the, the institutions he's set up, uh, as you say, is to, uh, to promote diversity within the, the, the photographic community. I don't think it was so much to promote it as to address the fact that there was not a lot of it mm. at that time. So um, he was seeing photographers come, being sent uh, from Europe to cover his own country and he felt that that was a problem. And then, so he started a school. And then he started the majority wall because even after there were students and even after there were photographers, he had comments from photo ed editors to say, well, I can't hire Bangladeshi. They don't, they don't know what I want. I have to send my guy. And this is all uh, quotes that you know, he's been giving out uh, over time. So um, I think that um, his, vision of this was about if you don't hear from a diversity of voices, how do you arrive at a more nuanced understanding of a majority world culture? How, how If you don't hear from the people that you are photographing from, if it's so one-sided, then we end up creating a worldview that is very narrow, as you said, and it really doesn't lend uh, any sort of understanding like what Artie and Stanley were saying about a bigger picture you know, so yes, we can take a photograph of someone on the street who's poor, like in that photo that we were seeing before, but what is the context of it? What is the reason for this poverty? What happened in the political situation of that country to lead it to this economic situation in the first place? And um, it is very often the big picture that's ignored uh, for the sake of the cliche. And so, you know, the more voices and the more diversity, the more the odds are you will be able to arrive at that. Now, that doesn't mean that every local photographer is going to give the big picture. I think that what she was saying uh, about the a bit like district in India, many Indian photographers have also photographed that uh, in addition to Western photographers, you know? So it comes back to the question of why are the photographers feeling that this is, how, how do we help photographers to understand that there are other ways of producing a story or to, to provide a more nuanced understanding. I think this is going to be ongoing uh, in terms of our demands on storytelling from photographers. It's good that we're even having this discussion. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and again, wanting to shift the focus away from the photographers, uh, because within the food chain, uh, often they're not necessarily that high up in, in, the, the, sort of in the realms of decision making. Um, and not to say that, of course, there, it, it, is, it is 
positive that you have diversity in the people who are taking the photos. But what about when we talk about those who are commissioning them, the, the agencies, um, and then those who are consuming them, the audience? What can we do in that regard? Because if a photographer is there trying to make a living and most of the money is coming from large uh, media outlets uh, in other countries and the demand from their audience is a particular type of photo which fulfills uh, a stereotype or a vision they have, what, what we, we get to a sort of a blockage in some respects when we have our diversified uh, sort of realm of photographers, but these other aspects haven't changed. Can I, can I answer that with a question and kind of ask Jennifer? Because we talked about it a little bit earlier. Because when I saw the issue of National Geographic on race, my first instinct was to be skeptical that they didn't mean it, that they are doing this because this was going to sell, you know, uh, and that it, wasn't, it didn't come from a place of principle that we want to admit to our racist past. That you know, uh, I, I I sincerely, my first instinct was to think that this was economically driven, this decision, and so. It, it, but is that a bad thing? I I you know like what you were saying, uh, in terms of what the audience wants. I think that's we. I, I don't really know who drives what, and I don't I, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer that today. But um, if it's sexy, and the audience like now is diversity and sexual equality in the Me Too movement. How many, you know, and we, we've seen what those Pepsi companies have done and uh, kind of riding on this wave because it's, it helps them make money, but how does that affect photo editors and magazines when they make that selection? And I, I, can't, I can't answer that, so that's why I want to ask Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Um, so, Rob, to answer your first question, I think, about audience and how much we can how much is in the hands of photographers and photo editors and audience. I mean, I think that's something that that we struggle with as a place that is producing long form storytelling. And yet our Instagram feed is more popular than than anything else, right? Like, so the content is there, right? We have, you know, say a 5,000 word article with 20 photos. How many people actually go in there and actually are going to either read that in print or online versus maybe click through a, a gallery on Instagram, tap twice because they like it, and keep it moving, right? And there's there's only so much you can take in in that format, which is you know a thirty second interaction versus a you know a twenty minute investment in in an issue, right? So. I think what we try and do, and like all publishers nowadays, is try and meet people where they are. So you're, you have the long form content, you are creating it on Instagram stories and Snapchat. But yes, if you spend 30 seconds on something versus 20 minutes on something, you're gonna get a different level of, of engagement. And um, yeah, so I think the audience has to, to, uh, to it is a chicken and egg kind of um, issue. Um, and to to answer your point, I mean, I think for the issue on race, I think, um, I mean, I can talk about this more when I um, talk through my slides. I mean, I think that the issue itself that we decided to do, we decided to do in April because that was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination, April of this year. And given everything that was happening in our country, we felt like it was an important issue to tackle again and again and again because it does seem like an issue that never really goes away and, and in fact, seems like it's getting worse in our country, um, in the United States at least. Um, but I don't know that, I think National Geographic's audience, especially the print audience, I'm not sure that it's a topic that they're like, Oh, this is going to be so great! We can't wait for an issue on race, right? Because we do have, we do have, quite, especially for the print audience, it tends to be quite a bit older, right? And people do associate National Geographic, sure, with people and culture stories, but there's also, you know, a lot of content on animals and on wildlife and on, and that's what people kind of know us for. So when you slap this, when we did a gender issue in January of, you know, I guess that was 2017, I guess, a whole issue devoted, devoted to gender which is certainly a kind of a newer area to discuss than race. Um, 
I, I don't know that our core audience was thrilled with that content, you know? Um, so I think it, 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 we felt it was important editorially um, and certainly difficult to, to, to do justice to. Um, but I, I do feel like both of them were, were risky in the sense that it's not, uh, there's, there's less controversy when you're, you're covering wildlife to a certain extent um, than when you're covering people and you're, you're, you know, especially for a 130 year old magazine that, that has covered race in a certain kind of way, right? One of the one of the things we wanted to focus on throughout this uh, this day was not just sort of diving into the the problems themselves, but trying to come up with some solutions or at least move further towards those solutions. Um, Jessica, you're mentioning the sort of the response uh, um, from sort of editors and publications that they well, we couldn't find anyone locally to take the photos, etc. And, and part of you know, majority world was a response to that. But I also know that, you know, the work you've done at Anchor sort of uh, is also uh, looking to remedy that. The way you, it is, I think, quite well renowned for supporting uh, photography, particularly in Southeast Asia. I know you've got some, some more slides. I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about sort of the role of Anchor in supporting that diversity so that people aren't able to say that anymore, encouraging local photography. I, I want to see what I put out on this thing. Ah, okay. So these are actually just pictures of the festival. So just to kind of give a bit of... Uh, the festival actually started in 2005, and it was founded by a group of photographers who actually, um, according to their own words, made their living in the region. So they were Western photographers, American, uh, European, uh, uh, and they were based in Asia. They covered the Cambodian the war. Uh, they they shot, um, they made a lot of fantastic, amazing stories, and uh, the festival was started by them because they wanted to give back. They wanted to do something for the region that had formed their career, so to speak. And so in 2005, they had started this workshop, which is the Anchor Photo Workshops today. And um, we, what we do is um, we have um, 30 Asian photographers that are selected uh, out of um, application process. Uh, and they come to Siam Reap for a week to and have a workshop with six teachers. So everything is free, uh, except we haven't arrived at a part of the budget where we can pay to have them come here yet. But they don't have to pay for the workshop. They get accommodation. All of the teachers are also um, volunteers, so that helps us keep the costs down. Uh, but the, the reason for, for that, for me even mentioning that, was because we wanted to address the economic uh, gap that exists uh, today. Uh, photography, as we all know, is extremely expensive. Having to buy a plane ticket to go to New York for a photo portfolio review, I mean, I, I couldn't afford that when I was 21. Uh, so we wanted to, they wanted, and in today in turn we want to provide this platform uh, in a more centrally located uh, place, which is... Siam Reap, Cambodia. Um, so the festival started uh, because um, we had a gathering of photographers and what they wanted to do was talk about work. So they started sharing work, doing exhibitions and uh, slideshows and the festival uh, aspect was born from that. But I would say that the education part remains very much the core of what we're doing. So we have over 300 plus alumni from Asian countries and um, we define Asia as very, very broadly. Um, we actually quite literally used the Wikipedia definition of it um, because I didn't and want to be in the position of deciding who was more deserving of being called Asian. Uh, so you know, it's, it's it's a broad criteria, so to speak. Um, so these are just some of the images that we were. That's from Cambodia, So Pao Yu Yu from Myanmar. Uh, these were produced during the workshops over the years. Satish from India, Kenji Philippines, Carrie from Singapore, and that's Truth South Korea. And these are our teachers. So one of the things that have changed though since we started uh, 14 years ago is that we um, we now are moving towards having the entire event and organization run by the Asian community to be Asia-led. 
and our panel of uh, tutors have also slowly evolved over the years to reflect that. But I want to say that the, the one thing that we look for uh, in our tutors uh, is that we look for people who are committed to helping photographers achieve their own unique vision. And I think that when you have a room of 30 Asian photographers, all of whom are being encouraged to be true to themselves and to sp speak their own vision and not to copy and not be told who they should emulate. I think that produces a very uh, significant, um, it, well, let's just say that the result is that, the result is that 14 years later, we are now in a position to do this, that we are now in a position to run the whole thing, you know? And uh, 14 years ago, I don't know if that would have been possible. So uh, over time with the development and more education, I'm very happy that we are now where we are today. Yeah. <laughs> if you can think about it, we'll we'll come we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, on the uh, keeping on the sort of the the positive. Uh, well, okay, that's that's timely because I was going to come to Jennifer. Um, keeping on the sort of positive solutions uh, um, yeah, vibe. Um, I'd like to. Um, uh, look at uh, uh, sort of the the work that you had edited uh, for this and the the subsequent uh, uh, issues that, that 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 came from it, um, and uh, particularly to focus on sort of I, uh, what do I call not best practice because I don't like that term, but what what was done that you think can be taken away by others to to do this sort of work well, and particularly with the fo obviously the work is focused on race. Um, yeah, so just to, to, I'll just kind of give a broad overview of some of the stories that I've worked on that have been part of this. So we did a single topic issue in April. Like I said, it was time for the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King, um, which is a big deal in the United States. Um, and um, that was the, the impetus for the, the single topic issue. And then we followed up with several other stories on race and diversity within the United States um, in the follow-up issue. So we're still publishing. We had, I think, one in July. We had another in September, another in October. We have another one in December. So it's, it was too much to fit in an issue, basically. Um, and, and certainly uh, we felt was topical and important enough to, um, to, to revisit. Um, so I'll just take you through some of my um, some of the things that I feel like were valuable that, that we did. So um, the issue that issue started off with a letter from the editor-in-chief, Susan Goldberg, um, that, because I think for us internally, as we were working on this issue, we really felt like we couldn't do an issue on this without acknowledging National Geographic's own role in how we portrayed the other, um, uh, often in, in a very kind of exotified, um, way, and so Susan interviewed um, historian uh, John Edwin Mason um, and kind of looked through the archive, and she wrote a letter acknowledging this, and it, and it, it went pretty viral, but I, I think we all felt like we couldn't do an issue on race without kind of starting from, from this place. So I think that that idea of, of reflection and acknowledgement and, and, and understanding that this is always gonna be a process, right? Even what we do right in 2018, you have to kind of revise and ask questions and figure out what you did right, figure out what you did wrong, and, and keep on moving forward, right? Um, so this is just a, a PDF of that, that page of that letter. Um, and this was another uh, project we featured in that started off um, the issue. This is Angelica Das's uh, project Humane. Um, so Angelica is a Brazilian photographer. Um, and I think her, you know, visually, um, her approach to, to this project is kind of matching people's skin tone with, you know, the Pantone colors that, that uh, you know, people in the design world kind of use quite often. Um, and it feels a lot more expansive than uh, kind of our categories of white and black and, uh, and shows. Um, and I think it reflects Angelica's kind of She's Brazilian, uh, which is a very multiracial country. Um, she went to art school, and I think this project really um, reflects both those that background that she's coming from, as well as kind of visually um, hit the mark of of you know 
when you start thinking about how do we visually represent race, um, I think her project really, really did that for us um, in the sense that it's not at all a scientific construct, it's a social construct, and uh, but a very important one that has a lot of big implications um, from Brazil to the US to, to, to many countries around the world. Um, another story we did um, in the April issue was about historically black colleges and universities. Um, so these are universities in the United States that are specifically for African Americans, um, and they were started in the late 1800s because uh, because black Americans were not allowed to attend college alongside white uh, Americans until the 1950s, which is not that long ago. So these colleges still exist today. Um, there are people attend them by choice now as opposed to um, uh, prior to that point. Um, but there's been an increase in uh, in enrollment and, and applications in historically black colleges and universities. So we, we sent two photographers down to um, a group of schools in the Atlanta area. Um, uh, Ruddy went to an all boys college and Nina Robinson went to an all girls school, Spelman. Um, and so this, you know, I think when we look at, you know, who's behind the camera and who's taking the photographs, you know, Ruddy's Jamaican, um, but has lived in the United States for like 20 odd years. And we were do, when we were working on this story together, you know, we really want we talked a lot about layering the past and the present together. And so this is uh, Morehouse students entering uh, Martin Luther King Chapel because Martin Luther King went to Morehouse College, um, and that's Martin Luther King's quote on the wall. Um, so this idea of kind of the past as a backdrop for the present and these young students now, because um, these these colleges have been, you know many great American leaders from the African-American community have come out of these HBCUs, including Martin Luther King. His father went to Morehouse. So this idea of, of that kind of legacy of activism and excellence coming out of these, these schools. Um, and this is another image that Ruddy took for that story. Um, and uh, these are two Morehouse students um, who wanted to strike up a discussion on campus uh, about the use of the N-word um, within their community, right? And, and so, you know, here in Hong Kong, I, I mean, that, that word is incredibly offensive in the United States. Like, I, will, I would not even utter the word. Um, so, but I think this is the power of having somebody like Ruddy behind the lens who already knows enough about the thing that he is shooting, this, the subject in the community that he is shooting because he's part of that community um, to engage with the students about that and to not only see that this is happening in the wee hours of the morning, but catch a, somebody walking by in a Tupac shirt who was one of the prime instigators of the use of that word in hip hop. And again, this idea of layering text and imagery and, um, and, and kind of working a frame. Um, so this is one of my favorite images as well. Um, uh, this is an image, uh, a series that we published um, actually in this month's issue, in the October issue. I don't know that it's on stands here yet. Um, but I think it, it also kind of speaks to, um, you know, who is behind these projects and um, uh, and the importance of who's behind the lens. Um, uh, so this is Paul Kitagaki Jr. Uh, he has done a long-term body of work on... Uh, on survivors of Japanese internment camps. So shortly after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, um, the US government sent Japanese Americans to internment camps. Um, uh, over 100,000 Japanese Americans were put into these camps. Many of them were citizens. Um, and so Paul uh, went to, he uh, found archival photos um, and then went and found the survivors. So here you'll see on the left, are, let me see, I have, their, I have their names written down. Um, but this is Junzo Ohara, Takeshi Motoyashu, and Edward Kato, um, who had been incarcerated as, uh, incarcerated as teenagers at Heart Mountain Le Re Relocation Center in Wyoming in the 1940s. So the picture on the left is from the 1940s, and that's the three of them kind of reenacting the picture um, in uh, 2013. So, um, 
And this is the kind of stuff that I think, you know, Paul has been working on this for 13 years. We happened to publish this, but this is 100% his kind of concept and his, you know, labor of love. Um, and he himself is Japanese American. And I'll show you a picture of his family in a second. Um, this is another uh, photograph from, from that project. Um, so that's uh, Dorothy uh, um, Hura on in 1942. Um, on the right, as she's um, about to, she was a college freshman um, when she was entering a, a detention center in California. Um, and she, in her, in the article and in her quote, she kind of talks about how she didn't even know what was happening. She just knew something exciting was happening. And I feel like that really shows in the image. Um, and on the left, that's her at age 93 um, in 2017. So he went back and found all these people and, 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 and photographed them. Um, and then uh, this is Paul's own family. So that's a Dorothea Lang photo um, on the left. Um, and that's uh, Paul's, um, let me find my right. Um, so that's Paul's grandparents, um, and then his aunt and his father uh, sitting down on the, on the photo on the left, and that's his aunt and his father um, on the right. So the, the photo on the left is from 1942, um, and on the photo on the right is from 2006. So again, I feel like you know nobody but Paul could have done this project, um, I think, in the way that he did. Um, and with the time and the investment and, and really kind of, and I feel like that's for personal projects. Um, he obviously, you know, this has been published pretty widely beyond National Geographic. We were really proud to publish it um, as a part of this series, especially since right now there's so many echoes of that happening with different communities, right? You know, in, 19, in the 1940s, Japanese Americans were, were targeted as part of this, this uh, you know, questioning their their patriotism um, in our country. And I feel like this kind of thing goes through cycles, right? So this uh, project like this becomes um, very relevant um, now in our country. So it's another one of our my favorites that we published. Um, and then this one, I guess I would use as an opportunity to talk about um, not only who is behind the camera, um, but who are, who's, who are the editors and who is on the editorial team. Um, so this story was about South Asian Americans. Um, it was published in the September issue of the magazine. Um, and it was just about kind of how South Asian Americans have become much more visible in mainstream US culture. Um, and there was a big uh, change in US immigration policy in, the in 1965 that allowed uh, people to come into the country based more off, um, off their professional status rather than their country of origin. So at this time, a lot of South Asians came into the country, including my parents. So this was a project that I was super connected to. Uh, I grew up, my parents are from Sri Lanka. I was born and raised in the States. Um, and we had six South Asians on our editorial team. Um, in addition to, look, we had editors, me as a photo editor, another photo editor was Pakistani. Our writer was Indian, Ismail is Bangladeshi. Um, so we had a ton of ideas and a ton, I think, that allowed us and we, we obviously don't have that for every single project we do. Um, but for this particular project, it gave us a lot of uh, layers and things to kind of keep in mind um, as a starting point. Um, and uh, so this, pro this photograph was actually taken in Staten Island. Um, it's a Tamil Christmas carol service that my aunt has organized for like 30 years. My mom used to play piano in it. And so I was like, OK, why don't you go out there and see, see what you find? and he came back with this photo, which which um, we ended up publishing because it's kind of great. So, um, and this was a uh, benefit for um, it was uh, a benefit for the LGBT community in um, in India to to raise awareness and fight for equality in India by Indian Americans in New York City. Um, and that is um, Lal Bhatti, who's uh, a cancer re researcher by day and uh, a drag queen by night. Um, and so I think with this project, it was just like, we just, if we, we could have kept photographing for ages, we all had a lot of ideas. But I think 
by virtue of the fact that we had so many South Asian countries represented, we had, you know, we, we had a lot of diversity in the coverage. Um, and this um, is, uh, let me find her name. I know her name, I'm just blanking on it. This is Then Mozi Sundararajan, um, who is, who raises awareness about the impact of caste um, and religious intolerance in, in the United States. And she's with a Bangladeshi activist named Shahana Hanif. Um, and uh, we photographed them uh, at their, Ismail photographed them at, uh, at their lab, their studio in, in New Jersey. Um, so I, I guess just, I wanna just show a couple of the things that we've done this year as part of this race series. And I think all of them just reflect different uh, layers of, of um, things that worked in terms of, of not only photography, phot photographers themselves and what knowledge they were bringing to the project, but also our overall team um, and, and what, what as a group we were kind of discussing and um, where that took us. So I think that was the last slide. Thank you. Um, I'd probably come back to you yep. uh, um, to ask about how you f feel that, that, you know, when you, you do a project which you think works well, how that becomes institutionalized. But but first, um, I'd like to come to Stanley and see a, a sort of a, a contrast, because there was a lot of sort of quite uncomfortable soul searching in this edition, whether you take it at face value or not. Um, and you see how, uh, as a as a publisher, they've, the, 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 they've changed quite radically over the years. And that's something which uh, the humanitarian NGO sector has had to do as well in the way that it represented uh, the people it was working with and, and for, etc. cetera, yeah. Um, if you could pass me the clicker, um, just to give you a little bit of context if you're not too familiar. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we go back to uh, what we have here, some uh, images from the 1970s, uh, 1980s, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, humanitarian organizations came under a huge amount of criticism for the way that they portrayed uh, uh, people and focused uh, on particular situations. Um, and they responded. Um, and so we, we have here, I think these are, are two of them are examples from, from Oxfam Hong Kong, and I know you're gonna, you're gonna show us a, a few more, um, by producing much more positive uh, photos which focus rather on the rather than on the problem on the the positive outcomes. Uh, so the basically the the work that you do. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I was very interested in was uh, I know no it's not Oxfam Hong Kong but was the photo on the the bottom left, which was a campaign from 2013, which was a response to a, a survey that uh, Oxfam did in the UK, where they uh, received a lot of uh, negative feedback. Uh, from the public uh, around the, the images that were being used. Um, and so they did this campaign which uh, um, featured a series of um, uh, locations of outstanding natural beauty uh, on the continent of Africa um, as a way to try and draw people in. Uh, the, the, the backlash to it, um, it was interesting to look at as well. But uh, at Stanley, I know you're gonna talk a little bit about these changes uh, and the work that you've done here. Um, and, and within that, also something to do with addressing the power relations between those who picture, who create and publish pictures, and those who are the subjects or collaborators within the pictures. I'll, I'll pass you this so you can, uh, you can have control. Can we, yeah, uh, thanks, Rob. Down there? Can you show me the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think you know we've come on quite a long way, you know, from you know those images, which is I think fifteen years ago. Yeah, when we don't when we didn't understand the world quite well, and there wasn't internet. Yeah, and uh, and there were quite a lot of uh, perceptions that you know, okay, we have to show poor people. Okay, so we have to show. Uh, you know, some bones and skeletons, that kind of things, yeah. I think some organizations nowadays still use those photos to attract attentions, to attract fund fundraising, you know. But 
Oxfam, we don't believe that. Yeah, we want to. I think the because I remember the discussion we had. I had with uh, Rob before. Is that sometimes we we are not trying to show everything positive, but I think there's something we want to avoid. You know, uh, some stereotyping. We really try to avoid. So when we talk about Africa, we don't talk about okay, only you know poor people, only you know those who don't have food. You know, not not only that. There are a lot more varieties, a lot more diversity, a lot more realities in in you know, in the situations. So that's why I think when I first joined Oxfam, it was nearly 18 years ago. We are already like this. Yeah, we want to try to portray a more positive images, but it's not only the positive, I think it's a kind of change is possible, the message. We all can be part of the change. Not only we, but also all the beneficiaries on the ground. Yeah, they all are contributing to the change. Okay, how? I think what I'm going to show are three examples that I work on before. Okay, first, yeah, this is an um, this is an art exhibition uh, on working poverty in Hong Kong. Um, there are a lot of people in Hong Kong they have work, but they are still in very you know poor situations. We call it working poverty, and these issues has been raised for quite a long time, for more than ten years, but now nobody care. Yeah, and when we organize, we want to raise public awareness on these issues. And uh, so we try to use a different way to package the whole things. And uh, in these pictures, you see, um, we work with a curator, Ducky, and, uh, and also he worked with a, a lot of uh, artists in Hong Kong. Yeah, we want to, we give them the topics, okay? Uh, working poverty. We brief them the situations. We invite uh, 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 some union unions. They talk about the issues to them. We also arrange um, uh, field visits, and then with the topics, and then they create their own stuff. Okay, one example to show is that this is um, she's a cleaner, Madam Heng. Um, we took the pictures, um, and she was also invited to join the exhibition. So she is also part of it. And also she, we invited her to join quite a lot of uh, media interviews. So she's also part of it to voice out her concern. And also, but when you look at the pictures, this is the smaller one. She is not exactly a cleaner. She is a quite famous female slooker, you know, in Hong Kong. She got quite some awards. And um, we invite her to join and to have a dialogue, and she really worked a bit as a cleaner. And she had a dialogue with Madam Heng. So they interact, they take photos together, and, uh, and then afterwards, they share their concern on working poor in Hong Kong. So the way we do you know, the art exhibition, it's not just take the pictures, out of the spot and then show it to people. So it's more a lot more than that. Yeah. So this is one example. Yeah, this is another one. Another case uh, in the art exhibitions. Another one. Um, do you read me? Yeah, we did this exhibition three or four years ago. It's about the issues of uh, ethnic minorities, youth in Hong Kong. And they have quite a lot of difficulties in learning Chinese. And it has a strong linkage to the poverty situations. Yeah, because they had difficulties in learning Chinese. And then when they, after, you know, they may not be as successful as the Chinese in Hong Kong in public examinations. And it affects their, you know, for example, when they pursue tertiary educations, some difficulties. The <coughs> and also when they want to get a job in Hong Kong, because you know they may not be, you know, they may not command Chinese that good, then they 
may not get a job. Yeah. So in these uh, exhibitions, we want to tell the public that you know the difficulties they face and how we can make a change. Yeah. How to do it? Okay. So there are two parts of uh, the project. One, we did interviews quite a lot of um, you know, ethnic minorities youth in Hong Kong. But the way we do it is that we really go to, <coughs> we really you know visit the situations. We invited an independent journalist to write a story, and also we tries to capture the daily life situations for them and then show it in the art exhibitions. In other way, we also do some kind of, uh, you call it more up or design photos, yeah? So for example, one, we will invite them to go to, for example, um, a labor office, you know, to the government, you put it in a simple way, and then they, I want to be a social worker, that's their dream. And then we set up you know, the photo in, in front of the government office yeah, to tell people that they really want to have a job. That is his dream. Yeah. So that's another way to help to you know, portray the problem. Another way, actually I think that's, that's what I said before, we don't we want to, you know, in the process, we want to add a lot of values to them, to the Ye to a Yemen youth in Hong Kong. So actually, before we start all the shootings, we provided, it was in the summer, we provided free camera to more than a hundred <laughs> uh, ethnic minorities youth in Hong Kong. And our photographer gave them some trainings about photography, about taking photos. And in, the two, in two months time, they had that cameras, and then we, asked, we invite them to take photos by themselves to show how the kind of difficulties in learning Chinese in Hong Kong. Yeah, and then we collect the photos, and then we show those photos in the exhibitions. Yeah, and this one, the one you see now is uh, one of the EM youth. They show the photos in a barber shop. Why a barber shop? Because in in those in in the normal barber shop, they can't communicate with the Chinese barber. You know, they can't cut the ways they want to cut the hair. So that's why they show these pictures to tell people that we need our own barber shop and so that they can have their own style. So there's another way in their daily life to show how difficult they live in Hong Kong to integrate themselves. So we show this in our exhibitions. And also in our exhibition, we also do one very special things, which is very well received. We trained. Not only we, we provide trainings to them about taking photos, but also we gave training to them to be the tour guide in the art exhibitions. So they were there in the art exhibitions to tell their own story. Yeah. So we organized more than 40 tours around that time, and they were the ones to share the story. So they were empowered in the process. So that's why I said, you know, in for our exhibition, it's not only uh, showing pictures, but it's a whole package. We try to build in, you know, empowerment, capacity building, collaborative efforts. Yeah. Okay. The la. Oh, yeah. This is the one. It's interesting. Um, we also organize one activities for one ethnic minorities youth and also the Chinese youth to have some kind of interactions. Before they met, they exchanged letters to each other. And then we organized one meeting for them, and then they 
drew pictures together. So they kind of uh, do a lot of more sharing. Yeah. And then we show those pictures and letters in the exhibition as well. So there are a lot more values, a more, cultu more cultural exchange in the process. Yeah. All these are very well received in the, uh, in the exhibitions. OK, the last yeah. Yeah. So it <clears throat> the two exhibitions that I show, one is Do You Read Me About the Ethnic Minority Situations in Hong Kong? The other one is Working Poor. Yeah. And recently, uh, we have just launched this uh, inequality campaign yeah, in Hong Kong. I think this is a very abstract idea inequality. Okay, what to show people? Yeah, it's very hard. And I do remember uh, Oxford International, uh, we also use some kind of, uh, you know, images of two extremes. On one part is a very rich, a lot of high-rise building. The other part may be some slum, you know, showing the extreme. But in Hong Kong, yes, we, also f we can also find this kind of uh, situations. But people are getting used to it. Yeah, we may not get kind, that kind of uh, re receptions. You know, the they may they may feel uh, um, they may not have very strong reactions to those pictures anymore. So this time we make a different way. Yeah, we created a character. We call it the fair to ship, and. The fair to shape is the icon, it's the character that we create that represents inequality or equality. Yeah. And this is really, you know, this fair to shape, we have a quite a lot of um, you know, a uh, uh, story for that. But at the same time we we really make a real one and then we take pictures for this fair to shape in the reality, in the community. And on the left hand side, you can see, you know, that is uh, the IFC in Hong Kong, which is the, you know, the, the symbol of, you know, all the financial things, you know, in Hong Kong. Yeah. And the Chinese, it says, you know, is it fair? Is it fair? Yeah. We want to, you know, have one character created by us and also show it in the reality and then to create a kind of a sarcastic you know, um, feelings to the public. Okay, on the right hand side, it's, um, you know, it's a, a boy, a kid. Uh, he lived in a subdivided flat in Hong Kong, uh, which is getting very common in Hong Kong. I, they live in, a lot of our poor people in Hong Kong, they live in subdivided flats. Very, very small, but the rent is very, very high. Yeah, and they don't have their own, uh, desk, yeah, very small, just probably just an area like this, yeah. And uh, we put the fair the ship in, you know, sitting next to him. He he's doing his studies, and um, we wants to show. Oh, there's a series of these photos, mm -hmm. and we wants to create a different kind of uh, uh, feelings to the public. Yeah, so it will be a bit different from the kind of uh, images that we talk about, which is more authentic. Yeah, hmm. so I would say these are more creative. Yeah, use of images, but we are not. When we put it out, uh, I think there are a lot. Of, it's a, like a package, uh, and when people look at it, they know it's a kind of uh, design pictures. They wouldn't treat it as a kind of authentic pictures as we discussed before in the panel. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Sorry to sorry to interrupt, but just uh, I'm looking at the time, and in the interest of uh, making sure uh, that the audience can uh, can ask some questions, um, I think we have 15, 15 minutes. Um, so, do we have some microphones? They, they might not have any questions, and we could all go for coffee uh, early. But this, this gentleman here, I can see he has his hand up. So in, in the beginning of the uh, uh, discussion, we mentioned ethics and uh, a lot of 
things really to do that. So I would like to ask, in this age of profanity, when uh, literally every piece of media, not just for not just photos, just uh, videos, films, TV shows, everything, try to normalize uh, profanity, use of foul language and everything. So do you think uh, the ethicality, if, I don't know if it's right, ethicality is decreasing like in this generation? Like, and uh, how do you think it affects the younger generation of perceiving things in, in terms of ethics? You think profanity is unethical? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, profanity is unethical. I think, from my point of view, yeah. So, uh, I, I'm just trying to say that society is trying to normalize it, and I see it as a problem that is increasing day by day. And they try. I mean, it it normalizes uh, like sexual imagery, sexual uh, uh, sexually profane. Uh, expressions and if if it wasn't unethical then the problem of that photograph the the uh, photograph that you showed in the beginning of uh, lens culture would not be labeled as uh, unethical by uh, lens culture I mean by uh, um, the I, yeah. I forgot his name Sovid <laughs> <laughs> Sovid data yeah 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 I, I definitely think, like, in that field of, like, sexual exploitation and portraying it in the media, I definitely think things are changing mm -hmm. and things have changed for the better mm -hmm. and that there are better ethics now. Because I've worked in that this field for 16 years and I saw some horrendous um, practices by photographers um, 16 years ago, which, um, which I don't think... Would 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 be acceptable or accepted by the larger public, photo editors, media, you know, newspapers. That it wouldn't be accepted. So it's surprising to see that lens culture would have, you know, l you know, publicized that photo. Yeah. But um, you know, I've seen I've seen photographers take close up pictures, like like right in the face mm -hmm. of child victims of sexual exploitation and trafficking with narratives about their stories, just completely allowing their identity to be shown. NGOs um, themselves now have internal um, standards around what they will allow uh, journalists and media to access. And also, um, as we saw with the Oxfam example, um, organizations are self-regulating, you know, not showing images with more dignity and things like this. So definitely in that field, I think things have been changing. Obviously, new issues come up then because of world is changing all the time. Yeah. But I don't think you're referring to ethics as much as you're referring to the, the liberalization of society because mm -hmm. what you're seeing is media reflecting where we are. So, you know, just like how it's normal now to see women being portrayed as uh, professionals, mm -hmm. unlike 100 years ago or 50 right. years ago, that would not have been normal. Uh, you know, so along with it comes... Uh, sexual liberation, so on and so forth. But uh, I don't really think those uh, those that's ethical as much as a reflection of society's values. Yeah. Let me go to you first, and and then David. Uh, hi. So. When you're take when you're hiring photographers or you know discussing with photographers about how to take images that are uh, very racially charged, how do you ensure that there isn't backlash from within the community? Because aside from like the African American community that has sort of reappropriated the N word, there are a lot of minority communities out there who are not as comfortable with you know certain words that have been used to discriminate against them so in that situation would you necessarily have that like at the forefront or would that not be as overt i think i think each thing is a case-by-case -case situation i mean in this that image that i showed by ruddy 
uh, the N-word was crossed out, right? So the two students were advocating for, for within their community for people not to use that term colloquially or in any capacity, that there wasn't a way to appropriate a word that had been used in such a demeaning manner, right? So I don't know that I can answer for every other community um, because that image doesn't exist. Like, I have to kind of look at the images that come in and what exists and, and make a make a decision from there. Um, and it's not that I'm sitting there telling him, go find this image. Some Some images, like for example, if we know that there's a Martin Luther King statue or a Martin Luther King quote on the wall, it's like, okay, let's go figure out a way to layer that. But the other stuff, you can't kind of make that stuff happen, right? Um, and you can't expect that it's gonna happen if it happens and you hope that the photographer is there to, to capture it. Um, but some of this stuff you can't really plan. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I think with racially charged image, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you're constantly in dialogue with the photographer. Like if I'm, I'm editing a story with, with a photographer, I'm in touch with them a lot about kind of a shot list about what things we know we wanna get. And then the longer time that they spend in that community, the more that they become in tune with what are the things that are happening on campus or what are the most important issues to that community. And I think they try and go after those as well. But you know, I think for for visuals, we're obviously also trying to publish what we think are the strongest images, you know? And and so there's things that, that are communicated better through text or through video, and then there are things that are communicated better through photography, and we try and figure out what that balance is. Um, a thought prompted by Artie's comments, actually, and also thinking about searching for practical solutions here, because of course, you're absolutely right that when photos uh, published and circulated, they're out there in the world and you can't recall them. But in the European Union, there is a right to be forgotten where people can apply to the search engines to have certain articles or pieces of information removed. And then there's a process for judging that. And there are problems with it because, of course, now there's a whole industry of PR agencies servicing politicians and business people who are trying to erase past scandals and so on, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But I wonder if we might think about whether the, the right to be forgotten might be used for imagery that we want to try and recall somehow, because you may not get it all back, but certainly if you could control, if you could have the power of the search engines removing certain things and that was accepted, it would be a pretty major step. For sure, I think if I think I think those kinds of laws and regulations will need will need more of them, and of course, if you go to Facebook or Instagram or anything like this, you can get stuff taken down. Um, you can't stop people sharing it on their own, um, you know, on their own um, gadgets. But yeah, I mean, it's just uh, I th I think that's a, that's a really good point. You know, yeah. I just remembered today. Um, that there were some images of me, just innocuous images of me when I was play I was living in Cambodia and I was playing with some kids and somebody took some photos, and later um, I found them on Getty Images. Is that does that happen to people? <laughs> like, I was like, why did that person sell these pictures? Like, yeah, it was so weird. Did you reach out to the photographer? No, I didn't. I should have, I suppose. But I was just like, what? That's so weird. Uh, gentleman at the back of his hand up. Um, yeah. Thank you, and thanks for a very interesting discussion. It was very, this continuing this conversation with the consent over time was very inspiring and also kind of new to me. And it made me think of, of blockchain and this new technology that's most famous from like, cryptocurrencies and, and that, but there's also artists or like musicians in particular exploring, can you kind of give more rights and control back to the creator of, of the art or the piece? There could be something similar here with it doesn't only have to be the photographer or the musician, but it could be the subject in the picture that is also getting some control with this. So my question is, broadly is, where is blockchain in the photographic community? Is there a lot of conversations about that way of controlling images. Uh, who, who would like to field that one? <laughs> Any experts on blockchain here in the 
photographic community? I, I, I think I was silent on just that question. Uh, I, I know, <laughs> what? Oh. So, someone, do you know about this? There is a movement it's, um, that was sponsored by uh, two women, I think one from Argentina and I forgot where the other woman's from. They're yeah. trying to create um, digital art where you can buy on the blockchain and the digital art uh, and the photography is actually created online and then you buy it through Bitcoin. So I think there, um, there are certain art markets that are being used um, through Bitcoin and blockchain that are trying to um, they're trying to use it as a platform to give money back to the personal creators. So, for example, in this um, art uh, art market, um, the the artists who are creating the artwork, uh, photography and um, di visual as well, they're, for example, one is uh, from Venezuela, and they can't actually have access to sell their art in Venezuela because they're just uh, it's not possible. So people internationally can buy it, and it's actually helping sustain them. Thank you. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, unless there is just one quick question. One quick question. There, yeah, we have another panel as well. Um, uh, I'm gonna, as you, you, well, you were answering the question as well, but uh, I, 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 is there anyone else who hasn't spoken? This lady here, is it quick? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to ask Jennifer, she mentioned uh, right now in social media is like uh, people look at photos really quickly. I want to ask uh, how can we work on in-depth photo coverage around social media nowadays? I mean, I think there is still room for, for that on social media. I think people do series. I think people do uh, kind of galleries. Um, but I think for us, when we produce stories, we don't think about, we, I think we think about everything working together, right? It, photos, videos, text, maps, graphics, all working together to create a complete story. So I think, um, I think people do do you know long form storytelling on Instagram and and long captions, um, uh, continuous stories that they kind of come back to and 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 release over a series of days or weeks, um, but I think it's hard because you're not getting uh, I, if you're self producing this stuff. Um, I think unless you're doing it in your own backyard um, and there's very little cost, uh, then that can work. But I think if you're trying to, it, it might get you. Um, an audience and an interested audience, but if you're if you're trying to make a living, it gets kind of harder to monetize that, right? Um, but that's not to say that it's not useful. I think that's that's. I think some sometimes um, there's a work that you do on assignment, which is uh, more limited in scope. And then I think a lot of people have, you know, through social media, through Instagram, have pursued personal projects in as much depth as they want to, and have uh, been hired as a result of their personal projects, which is what they're most interested in and reflects their own style as well as interests, you know, and they're able to kind of uh, determine what niche they want to fill by, by doing their own personal projects um, on their own accounts. Does that answer your question? Can I just say something really quickly because in addressing what Patrick was saying earlier about how his workload has increased 35% now in the digital era and also his reminder to the students that you need to know why you're doing this. So when you're producing something that's intended to satisfy an audience that's expecting to see something in 60 seconds or less, what is your intention is it for that person to click like or to click a link to read more? And then are you going to be able to produce uh, that in 60 seconds to create the action that you want the audience to take? And I think that these are going to be questions that the young generation is going to have to tell us what the solution is, because I don't know what blockchain is yet. So yeah. <laughs> can, can I just add to that? It's not social media until you interact with it. It's publishing. So until you interact with your audience, it's publishing. It only becomes social when you engage with your audience. Keep that in mind. OK. 
Thank you very much. Uh, special thank you to uh, our panel. Uh, if we can have a round of applause, please.